What would you do if you knew anything was possible for you? My name is Holly Moore and I started an events company 10 years ago from scratch at my dining room table. Join me over the next few weeks and hopefully at the end of it, you will see why anything truly is possible for you. started with, uh, it was one of our big birthday parties. Um, my wife used to love parties on big dates. And um, we needed an organiser. And I got onto the Lowry Hotel to book the room. And I said, can you recommend somebody? And they recommended somebody. And I, I knew her by reputation and she just wasn't for me. So I said to um, Lowry, have you got anybody else? Well, we've got this young kid who, <laughs> has done it before many times, worked in the industry, but not on her own, not on her own behalf, her, her own business. So I said to my daughter, Lee, interviewer. So Lee interviewed Holly a couple of times without even knowing who she was being interviewed by. I said, don't let her know. So my daughter then said to me, dad, I think you should see her. She might be the one. So Holly came to see me and we had half an hour, a cup of tea in the kitchen. And I said, Holly, um, I like what you're talking about. These are the rules. You keep it quiet. You don't publicize things. I don't want social there. I don't want any, any publicity for my parties, the private parties for my guests and for me. My job is to pay you on time and I promise you, I will do. Holly performed so well for me. She even took the mobile phones off her staff when we were having uh, the, the first party. And it went well. And from that day, we've never used anybody else. Holly has done every party. She'd never let me down. And she's getting a big head now. But um, <laughs> I promise you, she's worth every penny that we spent with her. And it's been perfect. And the relationship is good. Well, thank you so much for those lovely, lovely words. And um, today, um, so Make Events is 10 years this month. And you were uh, one of my first clients. Um, and so I asked you if you'd been on the podcast for so many reasons. Um, I think our listeners are definitely going to want to know a few tips on how to make a little bit of money. Um, but also I want to talk to you about other things that maybe you haven't talked to people about on podcasts before. So one of those things being fitness. That's why we sat in Fred's lovely gym today. Um, also on meeting and being with your soulmates and also leaving a legacy and all the charity work that you do. So um, lots of questions for you today. Um, and we shall start off um, with your early childhood years. Um, so Fred, you've talked to me about as a young boy, just knowing you were going to make something of yourself. You didn't exactly know what that was, but you told me you knew in your early life, you had that feeling you were going to be successful. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, um, I'm a Salford boy from Oddsall, which is probably the roughest part of Salford in, in my day. And I think it's improved since then. Um, we, I had nice parents. My dad was an illegal bookmaker. Uh, in the war, during the war, he was uh, an ambulance driver, but he fitted that in with his illegal bookmaking. Um, they, there was two boys, two girls in the family. We had four kids in one bedroom because it was a two up and two down. It was a happy childhood. I hated school. Um, I had no time for school. I was just wasting my time there because I am dyslexic. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, well, I don't, I don't think it's a handicap because I've been okay with it. And I've read about people su who successfully made money uh, who are dyslexic. So it's, it's not that big a drawback. I mean, it's not, I wish I wasn't. And it yeah. takes me a long time to read a book, but I read a book. Yeah. I had a, a good, happy childhood um, with no, no great ambition to be uh, a superstar in any way. That never came into it. I was uh, like every other kid in the street. I enjoyed my life. And that was about it. Leaving school at um, 15, I went to an engineering company in Eccles and uh, to become a draftsman. A draftsman is like, uh, I'd describe it as an engineering architect. And I hated the job. It was, it was just not me. It was a, a square peg in a round hole. Uh, there's an opportunity to came about to go into bookmaking and I took the opportunity. It wasn't, 
it was still illegal mm. there. It was 1959. Betting became legal in 1961. And did I have an interest in betting? No, I didn't. I wanted a job. I needed a job. I needed to earn. And I went into it. And I took, took to it like a duck to water. When I was 21, I was managing office with maybe 20 guys in it who were all much older than me. Um, I learned mathematics through bookmaking, not at school. And you learn to think quickly on your feet because it, it's the quick and the dead in bookmaking. If you're not quick, you lose your money. Mm -hmm. And so you learn through your mistakes. And I, I believe, and I still believe now, you learn more through the mistakes in your life than you do out of successes. Because I believe that if you're successful, you don't need anybody, you're king of the world. You need help and success and somebody to build your confidence when things are going against you. So that's what I learned. I mean, I learned it, my, what I've learned, I've learned on the streets rather than uh, in school. To sum up my childhood, I was it was a happy childhood. It was just about playing football and uh, and then going out on my own. And would I change it? No, I wouldn't change it. I'd I'd do exactly the same again. Um, don't seem to have held me back at all. Think. <laughs> and what can you describe that feeling like as a young boy that you just knew would be maybe more something more? What was that feeling that you felt? I, I, I feel. Um, there's no shame in being born poor, but you don't have to die poor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's an opportunity there for anybody who wants to take that opportunity. Mr. Market is open every day. And we were coming to, into uh, recessionary times now. Yeah. And I think it's going to be really, really bad. But there's opportunities there. Yeah. In recession or, or when things are going well, there's always opportunities. It's up to you to find them. I always had belief that I would make it. Yeah. I had, um, I, I am an optimist and I yeah. think that helps because if you're a pessimist, you will always find a reason why you shouldn't do something. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get battered. And I have bad days like everybody else when things are not going right. But, you know, from those bad times or the hard times, you learn from it and you, you, you don't do it again. You know, you put your hand in the fire and you burn it. You yeah. don't do it twice, do you? Yeah. Uh, so uh, th I take it in the round. I am supremely um, ambitious, even now at my age. Yeah. I'm probably more ambitious now than when I was uh, a young man. And, it, and it's not about um, money because the last thing I need in my life now is money. <laughs> but it's being right and doing things and doing things well and seeing successful, well-oiled businesses. Yeah. Um, I just enjoy it so much. So, again, just to sum up, I was... I knew I would make it. Yeah. I didn't know what I'd make it in, but I knew I would make it. So that's self-belief, really. Um, so how do you turn, you know, we're going to have listeners that have maybe working for somebody, want to start their own business, don't know where to get the cash from. So literally, I know that you started with, you know, zero pence and you are now, I think, a billionaire. Would you say? Well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, I, I'm embarrassed to say things like that. But, the, you know, literally people think you have to have had, you know, a rich upbringing or investment. You literally started with zero pence. So please talk to us. How did that, you know, that, that zero pence, how did it start to grow? What did you do? Well, I, first of all, I, I learned how to, uh, about, about bookmaking. Yeah. And I, this sounds conceited. I was good. Yeah. And I know I was good. Yeah. And probably I was cocky as well. And my heroes weren't footballers. My heroes was businessmen. I used to always read business books about, about Jimmy Goldsmith and Lord White and Lord Hanson and John Bentley. These were all successful people. I'd read about them in the Sunday Times, how they'd made all this money and thought, I'm going to be up there with you. Yeah. And... Um, if you know what you're doing, you know your business, there's a way to find money. Um, you go to, banks are difficult and they will always be difficult. Banks want security off you. And um, when you've got nothing, you've got nothing. Where's your security coming from? So maybe you should find backers. Now, in my case, 
Uh, I had a little bit of luck as well. I had uh, I backed England to win the uh, World Cup. I put two hundred pounds on them at eight to one, which was a fortune for me. When I, if you think about it, when I put the two hundred pounds on, I was earning twenty pound a week. Wow! So I put ten weeks' wages on England to win the World Cup, and the uh, eight to one. So I got a stake there. From that, I went to buy my first shop when I was twenty four. I went to a man called Fletcher in Salford and I said, Mr. Fletcher, I believe his shop is for sale. He said, no, it's not true. Come down and see me. So I went to see him. We sat down. I liked what I saw. And I always had the same thing. I used to walk around anything that was biting. I'd investigate it. I'd see where the pubs were, were where the bus stop was, where the post office was, where checking the footfall, mm-hmm. how many chimney pots were there. I'd do all that. And then he said to me, I'm retiring. I want to get out of it. He said, I've got a bad back and I need to retire. I said, how much do you want for the business? He said, I want £4,000. Well, that was enormous. I knew I couldn't raise it. But I went home and I'd got some money in the bank from my winnings. And I went around the family and borrowed money off them. And we got £2,000 together. I went back to see him on the Monday. I said, Mr. Fletcher, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Why can't you do it, son? So I said, because I can't raise the cash. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you uh, a mortgage for a loan for £2,000. I want 10% interest on my money. And my first job every Monday morning was to send him a cheque for £20 plus his interest. And that's how we started the business. So where I'm coming from, it's never easy doing it. But if you've got the ability and you've got the skills, you will find a way there. It's just getting that seed corn to start. And when we started the business, we didn't start the business to build an empire. And I won't even describe it as an empire now. It's a big business. Um, It was to feed a family. And we opened the first bank account with 75 pounds. We went into Barclays and that's all we had. But if anybody came in, with a big bet that was going to win more than 50 quid, I would phone the bet to another bookmaker and cover the bet. It was like insurance. Yeah. And if it won, I'd have to send my, my dad round for the money so I could pay the customer. So it's those are part of the skills of being a bookmaker is, uh, you could call it ducking and diving, whatever you, the phrase you want to use about it, but it's you living on your wits and and your skills that you've uh, adapted and honed through through life. So anybody out there listening to it, you'll get a, not, a lot of knockbacks with it. Don't give up with the knockbacks. Mm-hmm. And if you fail, don't worry about failure because, I mean, the Americans say to succeed in business, you have to fail three times. There's no shame in fa- failing. There is a shame in this country, but I think it's wrong. Um, have I got it right all the time? Absolutely not. And I'll make mistakes again, for sure. And I'll back some of the wrong horses. But if I get it right most of the time, I'm doing okay. And most of the time, I do okay. Yeah, I think something that I've always been told is weigh up the risk and think about the worst that can happen. And if you can deal with the worst, take the risk. And if you can't, don't. So how do you, what's kind of your tip to the listeners on how to weigh up that risk and make sure it's not going to be too detrimental if it did go wrong? Well, I I would say this, you've got to take risk first of all, Mm -hmm. because that's what business is about risk. If you don't want to be a, a risk taker, stay in the comfortable job that you've got. But you know, there's more fun in working for yourself yeah. Uh, I um, uh, like um, working for yourself as being uh, a trapeze artist, but there's no safety net there. When you fall, you bang the floor yeah. and it hurts. But, you know, if you've got the skills, you get up again and you can all the worst that happens to you, you go and find a job. And yeah. if you're good enough, you'll get a job. But the exciting thing is working for yourself and You've you've only got two hands and two feet, but you've got one big brain. And if that big brain is good enough, it'll get you through. And that's because that's the strongest muscle in your body, in my opinion. And you will find a way. And, you know, I get a big kick out of working with people. I get a big kick out of the risk of it. I, I can honestly say right throughout my career, there's never been a day when I thought, Tomorrow morning, I've got nothing left. I always had 
some elbow room to 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 maneuver. Like I've had really bad days. Yeah. But I've always been able to survive those bad days. And if I can survive the bad days, I can come back again. Yeah. But have confidence in yourself. And that, at times that confidence will get battered. And that's when you need a Fred Dawn behind you just to say, we'll sort the bank out. We'll sort the accountants out. We'll get on with it. We're going to start again. This is an opportunity. Yeah. Have you ever had days where you've kind of resented it? So... You know, sometimes when it is overwhelming, everything seems to be going wrong. You can kind of resent the business and, you know, have you ever had moments like that or never? No, I've no. never had a day when I resented the business. I've yeah. got, I mean, my first love is bookmaking. Yeah. And it spawned off many businesses, which, yeah. I mean, you might want to talk about yeah. later, I don't know. But my first love has been bookmaking and it always will be. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, bookmakers get criticised. Uh, I've never been ashamed of being a bookmaker. Um, we talk about gambling addiction in this country. It's not 0.2% of people who have a bet have a problem. Yeah. Not 02 So that means 99.8% of people don't have a problem with it and it's enjoyable for it. And where that 02 are, I mean, it's the same in drink, in drugs, Whatever you do in excess is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, one problem gamblers, one too many for me. For me. We don't yeah. want them. They're yeah. bad for business. They're bad for themselves and bad for the families. Um, but, you know, in bookmaking, all the bookmakers I've known, the traditional bookmakers have always been men of their word. Yeah. We, you know, what we say, we do. And that's the way I've always delivered. Mm -hmm. If I promise, we deliver with it. Yeah. Have um, I resented days? Never. Have um, I resented any of the businesses? No. I've had, I've had a couple of businesses that have failed and I treat it as a learning curve. Yeah. Uh, and they've, they've failed for reasons. Uh, I mean, I could go into it chapter and verse with you. Um, but you're not going to back winners all the time. Nobody does. Okay, that actually really naturally brings me on to my next question. Um, you've invested in businesses outside of bookmaking, you know, properties. You've also talked about um, buying shares. Um, what? Um, tell us a little bit about that and how all that came about. Because I think something you've talked to me about is when you were using a particular business as a consumer, so for example, HR, employee law, um, and then you were created Peninsula Business Services, um, it feels like if you've used something quite a lot as a business, you've then created it yourself. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I mean, you mentioned stocks and shares. Yeah. Um, uh, in December 19, I'd noticed William Hill's uh, share price was going down the pan. Uh, they started about £3.50 and I started buying the shares. Something like 80p I started buying the shares, uh, both for me and for my company, Betfred. Me personally, I'm Betfred. The share continued to go down and and I had... Uh, I had it, it's not fair to call an inside track on William Mills that I didn't, but what I did, I had an inside track on the industry that I'm in. Because I take the view that if I've got good results and I'm making money, all the other bookmakers should be doing the same. Mm. They should be making yeah. money. If I get bad results, I'm losing. The other bookmakers are getting the same results and they'll be losing. So I knew I was trading okay. I knew their share price would uh, had been overdone the way they were handling the share price. And it went all the way down to from three pound fifty to thirty five p. Wow! So and you bought? Did you I, buy at three fifty? I, 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 no, I never bought at three fifty. Uh, I started buying about ninety p. Yeah. But at one stage, I was losing close to thirty million pounds on that one transaction. But my theory was still strong there, and my confidence was still strong, because it's difficult when everybody else doubts you. You're the one soldier in the regiment who's walking one way and the rest of the regiment's walking the other and think, what's the maniac doing? <laughs> um, so I continued to buy. Um, there was, I had a claim against HMRC mm -hmm. for 114 million. And I knew if I won my claim, William Mills would automatically win their claim. Right. So we took HMRC to court 
and we won our claim. Then I had to go to appeal with it, but I knew if I'd won the, the first claim, my guys were saying to me, Fred, we believe we've got a 90% chance of winning the appeal. Yeah. The over, uh, uh, the William Hill shares was overdone what they were doing with it, selling it. And I knew there was a possibility that someone would, one day would come and do a takeover bid with it. So right throughout 2020, yeah. I stood there, I kept buying, 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 and I had all my nerve. And then in 21, I won the case, they won the case. Then a takeover bid came in for William Hills. And I walked away with a profit of 90 million pounds. Casual. <laughs> but you know, you know, when they say you need balls of steel, yeah. at one case, at one time, I needed balls of were steel. Were people to around start. you thinking, what, you shouldn't be doing it? They were doubting me, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was my experience with stocks and shares. Uh, do I do it much? I dabble. Yeah. I, I, I dabble, and I've dabbled quite successfully. Yeah. I specialise in bookmaking shares or gambling shares because I just have a feeling when things are going yeah. well or when they're not going well. Just at the moment... Um, I feel that our industry, bookmaking industry, is no longer sexy, but in yeah. another five years will be sexy again. Yeah. It's cyclical, it comes round and we yeah. will do it. Um, how did I get in property? Um, an opportunity came in Salford where a company had gone into administration and the, there was a plot of land up for sale. Um, we were late to the party. And I bought this plot of land, for, I paid a million pounds for an acre. And I put the offering on the Monday. By the Friday, I'd signed it, done, deal. No caveats, no uh, if that or the other, we bought it. Then I bought the next plot to it for another million pounds. And we built 405 apartments on that plot. Yeah. So it was very successful. Uh, from that, I sort of got sucked in with development with yeah. um, with my company Salboy, which has been massively successful. And from that, we started a company called Domus, mm -hmm. um, backing two people. One, uh, my partner Simon in Salboy, um, a salesman, yeah, but good at finance, and he's come on over. The, he's worked for me, uh, for me, and with me for the last ten years. He's a Salford boy, isn't he, Simon? He's a yeah. Salford boy. Yeah. yeah, he's a Salford boy. Um, rough on the edges, he needs <laughs> a slap now and again, but he's as good as gold. Um, he worked for one of my companies called Golden Tree. Yeah. He was the uh, number one salesman there. He did 70% he did of the sales and he never had one deal go wrong because he wow. did his DD properly yeah. on people. So Simon comes to me with an idea, we're getting development, and it's gone on from there. Simon is now a wealthy young man and with a fair wind behind us, within the next few years, it should be a major company. On the back of that, we've got our own company, construction company called Domus. Um, started from scratch with this, uh, with this company with a guy called Lee McCarran. Lee was vastly experienced working for other people he worked, worked for private equity and he hated every bit of it. He was talking about balance sheets and uh, cash flows and forecast rather than laying bricks and yeah. putting concrete up and doing development. He spent all his time doing that because the first thing private equity says to you, how much do you want to take off the table? We didn't do that. Yeah. So that has been very, very successful. Um, Currently in the can for the next five years, we've got 1.95 billion in contracts over the next uh, five years. So you can see we're going places with that. Is that for you? I mean, I'm really familiar with your properties across Manchester and further afield now. Um, is that for you about leaving a footprint on the city as well? Like, is it important for you to have your stamp on Manchester and Salford? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. But what I would say is this. I, I love making money. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love making money the right way, yeah. meaning 
I don't want to build something that's shoddy. I want something that I can be proud of. I can walk down the street and look you in the face and say, I've done my job properly yeah. for you. I don't have to cross the road because I'm ashamed of what I've yeah. done. Um, that is the way. You know, you don't have to cheat people to make money. Give them value. Look after them. Give them a good service. No matter what industry you're in, and you will make money. You will survive. Um, I believe that the recession is on its way. We're yeah. going to have a really, really bad time, but we're not over leveraged in any of our businesses and we will come through it no matter what's thrown yeah. at us. Yeah. Um, but knowing your skills, knowing your people, and you know, I'm in a very lucky position that um, I don't have to work with people that I don't like. No matter how good they are, no matter how much money they can make for me, if I don't like them, I don't work with them. Full stop. That's it. So talking about other businesses, bookmaking being your first love, and then there's other businesses you've invested in. Um, obviously, I'm in the events industry, which took a massive hit during COVID. And I thought to myself many times, what else can I do? Is there something else I'll be good at? And I really couldn't think of anything. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people that will be listening that maybe have come out of one industry at the end of COVID, want to set up a business or get into another industry. Do you believe for that idea to be successful, it's got to come to you rather than try and dream up something else you might be good at? Well, you know, you said in you in, in the question there, um, I, I, I couldn't think what I could be good at. Yeah. It's because you're good at what you do because you've learned it. Yeah. So you've yeah. got to learn these skills. I suppose uh, I considered myself the most useful, a useless man in the world. And I promise you, I'm not joking when I say that. Like my hands, I can't use my hands. I can't use, uh, um, I'm so impractical about everything. People have to nurse me and do everything. I suppose where I'm lucky, um, or I've learned, I don't think it's luck because I don't really believe in luck. I think you make your own luck. Um, I've been able to make money. Yeah. I've been not to, not a finer point on it, but I have been good at making money. Yeah. Um, and I've been good at picking winners. And that when I say picking winners, I'm pick, picking people. Yeah. All businesses are the same. It's yeah. the people who run those businesses that make it. There's bookmakers who do not make money. Really? There's uh, events people who are going to fail. Mm -hmm. You're not going to fail because you've got the skills, you've got the enthusiasm. You know, you said you had a bad time during COVID. Of course you had a bad time. You had to get rid of people. Uh, which is a horrible word to say. I've said it wrong there, but you know what I mean? With that you had to lay people off. Those things happen. That is managing a business. You're back now, you're back on track, you've got your team together and you're going to be more successful than you've ever been. I am so ambitious and so um, optimistic about the future. Mm -hmm. The near future is going to be horrible for everybody, but the future is going to be there. Um, I wish we had a government that... Um, got behind us and cut out the regulation and the red tape that we have to put up with and the nonsense. And uh, I believe that we've got a cabinet there that, that are like cabbages. They don't, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and we've been ruled by these people. Um, so there is opportunities there. You've got to have the skills to do it. You've got to have some sort of a skill to be successful in anything mm. that you're going to be doing. And, it's up to you. Yeah. It is entirely in your hands. Just have the confidence. If you've got the confidence in yourself, you've got every chance. Yeah. Great advice. So going on again to additional businesses that you've developed, the um, recently in the in the press, um, we've learned about your collaboration with Gary Neville for St. Michael's. For people that don't know what St. Michael's is, can you just give us a little bit of an overview? Well, St. Michael's is... Uh, I think is probably the best location for what we're going to put together in Manchester, city centre Manchester. It's a bit unique. Um, Gary has been working and assembling this site for nearly 15 years. Yeah. I would never have had the patience to do what he's done. So he's put the site together and... It, I got a call from Gary, Gary saying, you know, would you um, come and talk to me? 
So we had a chat about it. Cut long story short, we've done a 50-50 joint venture where um, we're going to build offices, we're going to build restaurants, we're going to build a, a, a hotel, 200 apartments, serviced by the hotel. It's going to be one fantastic location. The development in total is going to cost in the order of about two, over 200 million. Um, we see fantastic potential in this. We will start putting spades in the ground sometime next year. And I reckon it's probably a three and a half year project to get together. Where Gary has been very skillful, he's had a lot of knockbacks through planning, objectors, and he's stuck at it. Um, I think we've got a good relationship. I like him. I find him very straightforward, very honest, um, respectful. When I say respectful, I, uh, I think it's an age thing but where Gary is with uh, uh, my age. But I'm looking forward to, and I am, that what we've seen in one another, I do enjoy working with him and we are going to make one massive success out of this project. This is nailed on, I promise you. We're going into it at the wrong time. We're going into <laughs> a recession. But recessions traditionally last two to three years. Mm -hmm. By the time this is built, we will be out of recession. We'll be on the way up again. They always say, don't they, as well, with a recession, you know, what comes down will go up again and what comes up will come down. So again, it's about holding your nerve again, isn't it? And riding the wave over whatever is going to happen over the next couple of years. Yeah, it, it is. But you know what? You've got to have a bit of wool on your back to be able, able to hold it together. Okay. But you know, the, um, the people, you know, you've heard the phrase, cash is king. Yeah. There'll be an opportunity there for people with money to take over people who, who can't afford to hold on. Yeah. But, you know, if I was in that position, I'd do my utmost to hold on and come through it all. Even if you have to mothball things and yeah. just take it easy and take a backward step and maybe cut, cut out the growth and just yeah. say, we're going to survive. Yeah. And when we survive, we'll then the only way we can go is up when things come good again. Yeah, because that's what my dad said to me, because we're set to kind of have our best year ever this year with make events, with the recession ahead. And he's just said to me, you know, you survived COVID. It's basically putting a little, you know, learning what you learned then back into practice and it's the second time round. So, um, yeah, really good advice. Um, so we talked about you've invested a lot in people and talent. Um Tell us what you look for. Now, I don't want a uh, hundred businesses now contacting Fred Doe <laughs> for a borrow, but um, what do you, what is it that you see in people that makes you want to invest in them and their business? Well, um, I had an opportunity one time to, to be one of the uh, judges on Dragon's Den. Oh, right. And uh, I'm glad I didn't do it because <laughs> uh, I'd throw some of the people down the stairs and say, what are you wasting my time for? I look, what do I look for? Um, Things have slightly changed. I uh, I have to invest in bigger businesses now yeah. because something I can't invest in a, a, a mom and pop corner shop anymore because it's just not worth my while. Yeah. But I look for people. Mm -hmm. I look for people that I believe in who have got talent, who who have got the scars on the back, who have been through it. Um, most of the time I've been successful with it, and I can tell you that where I've not been successful. Yeah. Um, but it's, everything comes back to one thing, people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at it, I mean, some of the crazies that you see have made wonderful successes of the, uh, the businesses. A man, a man I would not have backed is Elon Musk and look what he's done. So yeah. I would, you know, because I do think it is slightly crazy, but he's a big thinker. I've just read his book and I think he's a, a goer. He's a far better businessman than I ever expected him to be. I wouldn't have backed him. Why but, not? Um, it's just not my type of man, and mm -hmm. I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, opinionated, which I, I'd have been falling out with him after two weeks, because um, I'm opinionated <laughs> as well. But I, I can't really tell you. You know in your own skin yeah. when, you, when you're comfortable with somebody, yeah. when you want to work with them. Yeah. Uh, as when I met you, yeah. you immediately, I thought, this girl's got a chance. And you proved it. And what was that for me? Just again, to relate it back to people who might be listening, what would be um, the character traits? I mean, obviously, you're, um, 
you haven't invested in, in my business. You've used me as a, a, a supplier to you, I guess. But what was it? Because I remember at the time, back in 2012, the fact that you did use me gave me so much gravitas because people were like, well, if Fred Joan can have any party planner he wants, why has he picked her? She's only just started. So if you could say like a couple of character traits, what would it be? Well, you came over as honest. Yeah. You came over as naive. <laughs> And you were naive. Yeah. Listen, still you, have, I think. you were like a baby when you came in here. Yeah. But I, I, I like backing young people who've yeah. got enthusiasm, who've got um, an outlook, who want to do well for themselves. And I, I warned you. I mean, you would not have survived if you'd have messed up at that first party. Oh, that's for sure. Scared me to death. And you know, um, was that the one where your mum was on the door when uh, was uh, that yeah, first that was party? Yeah, that was the second one when. Uh, Gary Barlow was performing and uh, mum and dad came and helped me because I think at that time the business was only a couple of years old and I wanted them to be proud of me and seeing um, what I did. But I asked mum not to speak to you, but of course immediately she introduced herself to you, didn't she? Holly's mum in a make events hoodie or something. <laughs> so just coming back to you, you 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 gave me the confidence that you could do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that when you came into my house, you were nervous. Yeah. And I accept that, but I'm not so stupid that I think people are going to come into my house and meet me and not be nervous. Yeah. Um, but you've got to make allowances for that, and that's part of the summing up of people. Yeah. And that's where I think I'm good. Yeah. I think I can sum people up. And uh, I said many, many times, and I'll keep saying it, I do make mistakes, but I didn't make one with you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I always say that. Is it, I think you've said to me even recently when we've won a big contract, you said, stay humble, don't get complacent. And that's a good piece of advice to anybody, I guess. Uh, well, I still have that. I, um, I always have a, a target that I want to pass. Mm-hmm. And I always have a fear that somebody's behind me who's going to beat me. Mm. So I think that's a little bit of insecurity. And I think that's a good thing mm-hmm. that you're insecure because yeah. you think... I've got to be on my metal. Yeah. I spoke to a man the other week and I found him so interesting. This man is the biggest gambler, not the biggest gambler, the most successful gambler in the world. Right. And he was modest. He was humble. Um, You would never have put him down as that, but I found the guy so interesting. I could, I mean, I'm not going to betray confidences, Mm -hmm. but... um, it was a wonderful experience. I've sat down with him a couple of times and um, I just love talking to him about industry. Yeah. Um, yeah, people. Yeah. And on that, actually, another question to ask you is, so I don't really follow any of our competitors. Um, I'll get the team to have a look if we need to, just because I feel like if I see what they're doing, I'll be like, I want to do that event. Or So I try not um look because it will like make me nervous but then sometimes I will be like oh gosh you know do we need to worry are we going to be um and all the team will say to me you don't need to worry everybody's different every you know there's enough business for everybody so for a worrier like me what would be your advice on that well I would say always look at what your competitors are doing because Mm -hmm. if they're doing it better than you improve yourself by looking at it don't be don't be um so conceited that you know it all because you don't know it all nobody knows it all Mm -hmm. um I, I've not been good at originating things. What I've been good at is um, improving things, yeah. seeing businesses. And I think I can do better than that. Yeah. Always employ good people, people better than you. Yeah. Employ them, look after them because that's your, that's, that is the business. Yeah. Um, I think that's all I've got to yeah. say on that subject. Yeah. No, that's really good advice. And I knew I would learn things from you today as well as interviewing you. Um, so now we're going to come on to a slightly different um, topic to our conversation, which is going to be a little bit about female empowerment, fitness, growth mindset, and soulmates. So I'm going to start with um, your appointment of a female CEO to Beth Fred, um, which is exciting for the industry and for Manchester. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, it, it's... Um... If I say to you, in the Betfred organisation, the chief exec is a woman, Mm -hmm. the chief financial officer is a woman, head of security is a woman. We've just bought a business in South South Africa, the most major lottery company running in South Africa. 
run by a woman, owned by a woman. Um, my personal trainer for the last 14 years, a woman. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any problems with women, mm -hmm. but women have got to be good. Yeah. I wouldn't employ a woman because she's a woman. Yeah. I'll employ her because she's good. Yeah. Um, I do think women have one big disadvantage that men don't, and that is they have children mm -hmm. and they're responsible. Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways, women have to be better than men. Mm -hmm. But if they've got the skills, they've got the job with me. Yeah. Joe Dale, uh, her name is Joe Whitaker, but I call her Joe Dale because that was her name before she got married yeah. and I know her. Um, is good. She's yeah. the future and the past. Um, Joe's good at regulation and she's good at um, HR. She looks after people. She's got a good mind. She's still raw. She's still learning, but she's going to be good. She's she's the future. She's ambitious. Um Joe worked for me more than 20 years ago. She ran my uh, techie department. When we didn't have a techie department, mm -hmm. she was the boss and she ran it well. And she came in to me 10 years ago. She said, I'm going to start my own business. I said, well, what's that business? And she told me it was, uh, she went through it several times until I understood it. It was about child vouchers for nurseries. She made a massive success out of that. I backed her in that business. And then uh, she started advising me on the bookmaking side uh, on skills that I didn't have because the future is changing all the time. Eventually, I asked her to come in as chief exec. Yeah. Um, and she's been in that role for 15 months now and it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's still learning yeah. and, she, and she'll readily admit that. And that is one of the good things. I like people who say, I don't know, tell me about it. Yeah. Rather than sit there like a dummy as, and think that um, I'm kidding myself out of this one. I, I want them to think that I know. Ask questions. Joe is good at that. Yeah. My, Great advice. My chief um, financial officer is a woman. She came from, uh, from the industry. When my uh, finance direct, like, director left me, I put her in the role. She's very good, knows the numbers inside out. And they have to know, everybody have, has to know numbers when I'm around because right. I live with numbers. Yeah. Um, so I have no problem with women, providing they're the right women for the job and long may it rain with them. So there seems to be something there about potentially, and it's something that we've done in make events. Often I've bought people from outside the agency that have been at bigger agencies and it, for some reason it's not worked out. And so last year I made a decision to kind of put people in leadership roles that maybe weren't quite ready, but I trusted them. They had the work ethic. Um, I could see that their skill set could be developed. And so far for me, that seems to be working. Do you, is that something that you would have applied in that situation, would you say? I do apply that. Mm -hmm. um, you can get people coming in for an interview and they are fantastic, they're skilled, they can sell themselves. I've got people working for me who I wouldn't swap for anybody, but if they went for an interview, wouldn't come over well. Okay. You know, the one thing that you, um, you, you do know, if you're promoting from the shop floor, you know the skills of these people because you've worked with them for a few years. What you don't know from outsiders coming in, they might be fantastic at selling themselves, but when it gets down to the job, are useless. And I've yeah. seen that so many times. Yeah. Great advice. So talking about um, females, um, we're going to talk um, about the a very, very important female in your life, and that is your um, late wife, Mo. Um, and the reason that I want to talk about this is um, having known you for such a long time, um, we will have um, a, an audience that are in happy relationships, not in happy relationships, single, um, believe in soulmates, don't believe in soulmates. I've always believed in soulmates. I know Mo was your soulmate. Um, can you tell us about when you first met? Yeah, I was 15. She was 17. Um, she was going out with a friend of mine. <laughs> She saw me and she fancied me. So she, within a week, we were together. Um, Did you lose your friend? Uh, no, we stayed, stayed friends. <laughs> so he must have had enough of her already. Um, we got married when I was 21. Mm -hmm. um, it worked. 
Um, Mo died four years next month. Yeah. Um, we were together all that time. Um, when we started the business, uh, I think you know the uh, the story about that. Well, I'll just repeat it. When we opened our first shop, she became my first cleaner mm -hmm. because we couldn't afford a cleaner. She mm -hmm. became my first cashier because we couldn't, couldn't afford a cashier. My brother's wife, Anne, who died last year, uh, she was a cashier because yeah. we couldn't afford her. So it's a really, really family business. I had a 60-year-old love affair with my wife. Um, it still hurts. There's st still a hole there, and I find it difficult uh, at times talking about it. I do get lonely, and that's another reason to stay in business and, uh, and meet people because while you're working, you can't get lonely. Um, I miss her. Uh, I'd do anything to bring her back, but that's all gone now. Would it have changed anything in my life about her? Not, not one hair on the head. She was, she was, she was my soulmate, yeah. as you say. Yeah. yeah. And for, um, I mean, I've had many conversations with Mo about what it's like to be married to somebody who is as successful as you. And I think you would openly say that a lot of your success is due to Mo because of the way that she supported you. Um, so there will be, again, um, listeners who, male or female, that are married to hugely successful people. And that can be hard because they're away from home a lot and, you know, workaholics. How did, what did Mo do that was so important that helped you be who you are now? Mo, without talking to me, knew what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. It was that close. Yeah. She knew when to not ask questions and she knew when to ask the question. And it, she always got the timing right. Mm -hmm. She knew when I came in, I watched your day like, it's been okay. And she knew it wasn't. Mm -hmm. she, she could tell. Um, I lost uh, a general, I had a general manager when we had about 14 shops and I was devastated when he handed his notice in, he was going to start his own business. And she said to me, Fred, you ran the business before he came, you'll run the business again, now he's gone. Mm -hmm. And that was the sort of advice that she gave. She was a working class woman, uh, uneducated like me, um, but educated in life and she could give advice to people and she wouldn't give any, she wouldn't stand any, uh, any bullshit from anybody because that's the way she was and she'd tell it how it was. And if you, if you listen to her advice, even now my kid said, mum would have done that, mum would have done this. Um, so there's respect there. And this is respect that she'd earned. You know, you, you do, you, res you people respect you because you, you deliver mm -hmm. and Mo always delivered. And when things were very bad, uh, when things were tough. I mean, I remember one, one time we went out to, uh, we'd had a really, really bad day and I lost a lot of money, more money than I'd ever lost. And we were going out for dinner and, and she said, don't let's go. So I said, no, we went, we went to a small pub, the press in Pressbury and it was raining down and I couldn't eat because my stomach was churning over. And she said, get a gin and tonic down here. <laughs> and she held my hand at the table and that's the sort of thing that gave you comfort. And that's why we were together. And she had a wicked sense of humour. Um, in our um, Kylie Minogue dressing room at the office at House of Mate, we have a quote off Mo, which was always dress up, never dress down, which I tell all of my team. Um, to, um, I mean, I always say, I think, <laughs> um, I always say, you know, it's often, isn't it, when you're in a long-term relationship, you forget to make the effort, you know, us girls will get home, stick our hair in a bun, take our makeup off, put our fleecy pyjamas on. Mo always made an effort, didn't she? And that was something you loved about her, wasn't it? Absolutely. You know, you just said, uh, always dress up, never dress down. Yeah. My, ask my girls that. My yeah. girl, my daughters, they say exactly the same. That's what mum would have said. She never went to the supermarket without lippy on uh, <laughs> and dressed up going to the supermarket. That was her. Her hair was always combed. She was always clean and showered and smelt nice. And that was part of it. That was part of her. I didn't ask for that. It was what she did. Yeah. And that's why I loved her. Yeah. She was a, a beautiful, beautiful soul. And, you know, you lost her quite suddenly. She was diagnosed with a brain tumour. I know that it was really, really hard for you all to see. 
how is that because you know you as a family just presume Mo would be there forever so as 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 hard and as tough as you can be I'm sure that has forever changed you um in how you know what have been your kind of things that you've had to do to get over it because you have had to pull yourself up um what would you say to people well you're <laughs> For the first time it was diagnosed and she was told that she'd got a brain tumour, she actually turned to the consultant and said, I can't have a brain tumour. I've not got a brain. <laughs> That's what she said to him. Now, you imagine saying that when I you've know. just been delivered that news. I know. Um, it, it was tragic. I saw her go. Um, I said to the uh, consultant, how long can I give her? And he said 18 months, and she lasted about five. I took her to America. I went to um, the greatest hospital in the world, the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester. Um, They were fabulous. Um, Mm -hmm. We should have hospitals like that in this country. But unfortunately, it had gone too far. She'd got a grade four. And uh, it cost a lot of money to take her there. Um, she couldn't even travel, so we got a private jet there and paid for everything. And I'm glad that I did it because I'd never have forgiven myself if I hadn't have done it. Mm-hmm. And I would have always had that thought in my mind that if it had took her to America, she might have survived. She didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a big hole still there. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't even cook. I didn't even know how to put a microwave on I've never used a washing machine I think I told you the story about the first time I put washing in a washing machine it didn't go in the washing machine I put the washing in a dryer and I put the soap powder in the dryer and then I had to phone my daughter to switch out uh, how to switch it on and she said dad you've got it in the wrong way she came took the clothes out had to hoover all the uh, powder out of the machine I've done all the crazy, stupid things like I've had to put beans in in the microwave and put them in for 10 minutes and they've still been cold and I've eaten them. Um, I'm a bit better now. Mo did everything for me. I mean, we were that close. It, we never went anywhere together without one another. Yeah. I, um, I've never been the sort of man that wanted to go in the pub with six of his mates. It was just me and her. Yeah. Um, she was the same though, wasn't she? She wasn't one for like ladies' lunches or anything like that. You just loved being together. But she hated ladies' lunches. Yeah. I mean, she, what she did enjoy, she'd enjoy me going to the race courses. Yeah. And you know, you know, we're a wealthy family. And she'd go and she'd have a bet in every race and she'd put 20 quid on. And I could be, if that horse would have won where she had 20 quid on, I could have lost a million or two million pounds in the business. But she wanted that horse to win because she had her 20 quid on yeah. it. And that was it. And those are the funny things. And um, I, I can't say much more about her than I wish she was here, and, but, but she's not. And it's been a great relationship. And uh, I'll die a happy man. Yeah. So for, for kind of um, people that, you know, we have... People, listeners that um, will have been through divorce or, you know, want to, you know, maybe an unhappy relationship. You know, you were lucky enough to meet your soulmate at that age and and be with her for that whole time. Having never been through a divorce or a separation, if there's people listening that feel potentially they're not in the right relationship, do you think people should stick at it? Or do you think, you know, you know when you know and you should, you know, you all deserve to meet your soulmate? No, I would say this. And I would say it to my kids or anybody, if you're not happy, get out of it. Mm-hmm. I never had that problem. Mm-hmm. Um, probably because of Mo. You yeah. know, she was she knew how to handle me. Yeah. Because, you know, I have had uh, some tough times mm-hmm. and it's been a tough business. Um, but if you're not happy, what is the point in staying there? Yeah. And if you're not happy in your job, don't stay in your job either yeah. because you'll be no good at it. Yeah. You know, you've got to and you've got to want to get out of bed in the morning and go and do something because once you've lost that spark, you may as well stay in bed. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. Yeah. But um, don't stay in happy, un- unhappy relationships or unhappy jobs. Get out of them. So talking about getting up out of the bed of bed in the morning and being um, ready for the day, um, you and I do share a love of 5am club, wanting to get up at 5am and 
kill the day. Um, and also the reason that we're sat in this fabulous gym is your love of fitness. Now, I always say, so I am a gym bunny. I do the gym about five, six times a week. And I'll have people in the team say, oh, how do you do that? I couldn't be bothered to do that. Um, and I always say to people, I never went to the gym till I was 30 because I couldn't be bothered. And now I'm addicted. You were similar. You never used to go to the gym. And now you're a six days a week gym bunny. Tell us about how you got into fitness for all those people sat at home wanting to get into fitness but think they can't do it okay from being 15 to 35 i'd never did any exercise whatsoever um i just lost it after leaving school i used to play football at school and do swimming in things like that um my life was just work building a business being successful and enjoying it as well and when i was 35 uh, a fellow bookmaker said to me fred when you're 40, you'll be a multimillionaire. When you're 41, you'll be dead because you smoke too much, you drink too much, and you don't do any exercise. Why don't you come for a run with us? Mm -hmm. So I went running with him and I managed to run a mile and it was hard work. You know, I just managed to do it at 35 years of age. So I started running and then I bought a small sports business called Sports Tours International. And I went running with them and I was running with a guy called Vince Regan, who was one of the partners in the business. And I got hooked on marathons and half marathons. And I, I, my nature is competitive. Mm -hmm. So I did 12 marathons and I did probably 50 or 60 half marathons and I got the bug for it. Um, then things started changing as well. I stopped smoking, mm -hmm. so I've not had a cigarette for 40 odd years. Mm -hmm. um, my diet changed. Yeah. Um, my diet is now, um, for breakfast, it would be yogurt, seeds, different mm -hmm. fruits, nuts. Mm -hmm. I have the same. I mean, occasionally, when if I'm in a hotel somewhere, a good hotel, mm. I'll have eggs and bacon and maybe a croissant or something mm. like that. I'll let myself go. But I'm quite strict with my diet. Okay. I work out six days a week. Yeah. With the exception of Saturday, because I have to be in my office for eight o'clock Saturday morning to do Betfred TV, yeah. which I still enjoy. Um, but the other days, I'll do... Anything, I'll do two hours in a gym and it's pretty extreme what I do. Mm -hmm. And every every piece of equipment in my gym is used at least once a week. Yeah. Um, the one I don't enjoy, but I force myself to do is the skipping because there's no there's no escape from skipping. Once you start skipping, you, you've got to put the effort in. But I do maybe two hours a day in the gym. I do, I've got a dog. Momo, who's a greyhound. I walk her for about an hour every day. Um, I do dancing now. I'm learning dancing. I'm well, doing, I know I've I'm, heard doing, this. I'm, I'm learning salsa, yeah. um, which I'm enjoying. Um, but going back to the gym, I think it's important for that you you get out of puff every day. Mm -hmm. you, your heart beats. Mm -hmm. My heart, a resting heart rate is 55, which is wow, very, which amazing. is very, very low. Um, my blood pressure, it was taken this morning. It was 117 over 68, which wow. is yeah. pretty spot on. Um, and I think it's through the exercise, you know, why do I exercise and why do I keep a sensible diet? I'm not ready to die yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to die. I do. Want to, I want to do some nice things before I go mm -hmm. with some of the charities that I'm doing. Uh, I want to see some successful businesses, and I just enjoy life. Yeah. But I think it's important that you do something in in the form of exercise. And my advice to people who have not done exercise yeah. like you didn't and like I didn't. Yeah. Don't kill yourself when you start off. Do it start slowly because it's going to hurt and you're going to be stiff tomorrow morning. Yeah. Uh, but stick at it. It's perseverance. Um, and I think you need discipline. Yeah. You need to be strict with yourself in some ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like a, a glass of wine. I don't have a problem with any of that. Um, but look after yourself because you've only got one body and keep it well oiled. 
And for like a lot of people, so particularly in my office or in the events, because typically we can be on an event from like six in the morning till one in the morning, there's always chocolate, crisps, you know, we have to have what we call crew food, which is essentially lasagna or something like that. So a lot of people complain, I've not got time. Um, what and particularly as well females with with kids that give the majority of the childcare. what would be your advice to someone with the excuse i've not got time what do they need to do make time yeah it's as simple as that um i've i had that excuse but i make time for it i mean you said we both get up very early my waking up the first thing i do i go downstairs make hot water and lemon Mm -hmm. i have that that's how my day starts. I look at my figures from the shops, which takes 20 minutes, and then I get showered, wake myself up, into the gym. I've got a personal trainer who's been my personal trainer for 14 years, yeah. ex-ballet dancer. She's fabulous. Um, but you've got to make time for yourself. You know, if your car was broken, you'd get it fixed. If it needed service, you'd get it done. Your car's not as important as your body. Mm -hmm. Just get it done. Yeah. And so it sounds like you have quite a lot of rituals. Are you quite a creature of habit? Certain things you do every day at certain times? Uh, Those sort of things. The answer is yes, I am. Yeah. Um, I I, I hope I'm not boring. Um, I try not to be boring. It... um, I, I want to do my exercises. I mean, every night before I go to bed, I have one piece of chocolate every night 70 percent dark chocolate oh you are gorgeous yeah, i have one piece every night take ice water to bed with me um for the night um i don't drink enough water my trainer says to me drink yeah. more but i think you should look after your body because i mean you, you look what's happening in this country now with diabetes people mm-hmm. losing arms and legs and all the rest of it a lot of it's in your own making mm-hmm. i mean i was reading a professor from newcastle university who's written a book on diabetes he believes that you can reverse it mm-hmm. but it's quite extreme yeah i like to drink and with this uh you you cut out drinking for at least three months yeah you lose weight mm-hmm. and it comes back to you and and i think once you get the bug for it I've got a daughter who, uh, Nicola, who hated gym at school. She'd Mm -hmm. she'd write her own notes to the teacher, excusing herself how how she got out of the gym. Uh, Last week, she was in Lake Coniston. She swam for five miles in Lake Coniston. On Saturday night, she went to a place called Boundary Park in Cheshire, and she swam through the night. Um, She's phoned me up this morning. She just signed up to do a relay around Jersey next year. Wow. Her part of it is something like 15 miles of swimming. This is a kid who did not want to know anything, but she's, and her weight is good. And the way she's changed her life is good because of exercise. So, you know, it's not a chore. It becomes an enjoyment. I don't get frightened of getting on any machine now or any weights. I just do it. It's part of nature. Yeah. Oh, well, it's definitely working for you. I mean, I can't believe you are. Can I say how old you're going to be next year? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to be 80. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe it. You're no different to me than you were when I met you 10 years ago. Um, and you do yoga as well, don't you? Yes, Tell I do. Tell us about that. How's that helped you? I, I went to um, uh, Bangkok about 15 years ago and I met an Indian woman in the, uh, in the hotel who was a trainer. And I was a bit embarrassed. I thought yoga was a girl thing, <laughs> right? Um, far from it. And if you'd have asked me 20 years ago, I'd have laughed out doing yoga. <laughs> I'd have been embarrassed about doing yoga. But I got into it and I'm very flexible. Yeah. Um, I can put me, me uh, cross my legs and put my feet on, uh, my face on the ground, which most people can't do. Yeah. Um, and it's through yoga. And, you know, through yoga, something that I started doing two years ago and don't do enough of is meditation. Oh, right. Because I think it's mental as well. Yeah. And, you know, if you're having a tough time, yeah, it helps you. So I'm a big fan of, I do Pilates, I do yoga, I do all the physical stuff, weights and uh, aerobics, et cetera. It's a mixture, I think. Yeah. But I do think yoga is important. I think 
you probably get as much out of yoga mentally as you do physically. Yeah. Just to bring us to the end, something that you have touched on is all your charity work. Um, not only raising money for the likes of the Christie's and Anne's Hospice, I know the Christie being very dear to your heart because of Mo, um, but also your youth zone. Um, can you just give us an overview of what, of what you're doing in the charity sector that you're happy to share? Uh, okay. Um, I, I am always a little bit embarrassed about talking about what I do for charity because I don't want to be perceived as um, a big head who's doing it for publicity because I don't do it that way. Um, five, six years ago, Dave Whelan, Mr. Wigan, he used to own Wigan Football Club, Wigan Rugby Club, JJB Sports, said, will you come up and see what we've built in Wigan? So I went up there and Dave Whelan with 20 of his friends had put a a youth club together and I didn't want to go because it was a cold winter's night. I wanted to be home having my dinner. Uh, I said to Mo, I'll be home at half past seven. It was close to 10 o'clock when I came home. I was blown away with this youth club. It was far, far from anything better than anything I'd ever seen before. And I came back and it it just stuck in my mind this Mo then goes and dies so I go to see a guy called Sir Howard Bernstein at Manchester uh, Council and I said to Howard I've seen this youth club in uh, Wigan it's cost £6 million I want to do the same for Manchester you find me the land and I don't want it in the uh, pricier parts of Manchester Hailed, Altrincham, mm-hmm. Bowden those people are rich enough to do things for themselves. Find me the one of the poorer places in Manchester, and he came up with Gorton. And there was a place in Gorton called Gorton Tub, which was the swimming baths, which was pulled down. It was near Bellevue, and um, we agreed on it. So then I got my own construction company, and I said to them, we're going to build a youth club, and we're going to build it, and you're not going to make any money out of it. This is charity. Mm-hmm. And they said, how does that work with a business? I said, it works that way because I'm telling you that's the way it works. This money is coming out of my pocket, not out of Betfred's pocket or anybody else's. It's something that I want to do. So we started it. We'd come to an agreement with Manchester. Um, Joe Dale, my chief exec, is on the, she's chairman of the, uh, the committee there. And we built it and we built it on time and we built it on budget. We put six million pounds into it and we've got a few thousand kids going there now. We charge them a fiver to join and 50p a night when they go. And some of these kids, believe me, have got absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, We put Christmas dinner on for them for 75 families. We gave them turkey and all the trimmings. Oh, wow. And um, I get as much out of that youth club as them kids get out of it mm-hmm. because they've got nowhere to go. It's 80, 80% ethnic. Um, every kid I've seen in that gym is uh, not the gym, youth club. I'll go in the gym there is a gym there, there, there yeah, isn't there? Yeah, there's a gym there. There's yeah. boxing rings. Every one of them has been nice, respectful. Um, I gave a little talk to them the other week. The kids are nice. They came and thanked me. I've got, I get a massive, massive kick out of that. So the next thing is we're going to start building one in Salford next mm-hmm. year. Um, we've agreed uh, the land at the moment. There's a building on it and it's leased till next May. The, the lease runs out in May. We're going to flatten it and we're going to build a similar youth club there. So that's my next project. Um, I mean, I have visited it and it is absolutely phenomenal, the facilities there. Um, so... I feel from this podcast, even though you are a very shy to say a billionaire, you are, but I think we've also had some really relatable and amazing tips today that I think people will be able to relate to their business, their career, um, their fitness regime, and also their love life. Um, and I've been fascinated listening. Um, my mantra is anything is possible. Um, just to conclude on the podcast, what would you say anything is possible means to you? Anything possible. Um, I I think I'm a dreamer. Mm -hmm. I think you need to be um, an optimist and you need plenty of blue sky thinking 
And I'm looking for new angles and new businesses all the time. I've got one on my mind now, which I'm not going to tell you about, but, oh, can't but, we have a... but something that's really exciting me. And I'm just, it only started yesterday, believe it or not, when I pulled my uh, chief trader in and one of my technicians and I said, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to set the world on with it. <laughs> so it, it could, listen, I might even not see the fruits of it. But it's not about that. It's not about the money because most of the money I make personally now I give away. Mm-hmm. Um, be a dreamer. Be an optimist. Um, you will make it. Have confidence in yourself. And if you get knocked down, get on your feet again and do it because you can do Thank you so much for this episode. I have loved listening to you. I could listen to your stories all day. Um, Thank you personally for me for taking that chance on me 10 years ago. I have no doubt if you hadn't, I wouldn't sat where I am today. So um, for me and all the team at Make Events, thank you for helping us get to our decade. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. 